All right, let's pray and we'll get started. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here. It is an awesome thing, Father, to be with our family and to know, Father, that uh, that we are we are connected together because of you. Father, bless us as we study this morning. Bless us as we worship this morning. Bless us, Father, as we honor you and strive to glorify you. And we pray, Father, that everything we do will be a, will be pleasing and an honor to you. Father, help us where it's not to get that right and get it better. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Bless us. Be with those that we mentioned that are that are sick. Be with Alan. Be with Liz. Be with, with those folks, thought, Father, that, that we may not know about. Thank you for Connie, and thank you for what's going on with her. And, and we just pray, Father, that you continue to bless her as well and help her to get stronger. Thank you, Father, for blessing us, and thank you for the opportunities that come our way every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been talking about the leadership in the church. That's what chapter 3 is about. Understand something, for those of you who haven't been in here, 1 Timothy is a letter that Paul writes to a young preacher named Timothy who is at Ephesus. Ephesus is a really tough place to be preaching at. They ran Paul out of there. They tried to kill him there. And he leaves Timothy there, so he must have had a great deal of confidence in Timothy to leave him in that place where it was so volatile and so chaotic. If you go back and read the book of Acts, you'll find out really quickly there was some really nasty stuff going on there. There were some people that just did not want Christians there, and he leaves Timothy there. And so Timothy has got some real issues, and he's, he's trying to help this young preacher to deal with what needs to happen in the church. And, he's, and chapter 3 has been about the leadership. About eldership, about deacons, about husbands, wives, and at the end of chapter two, you know, about women and men and what what needs to happen. And he said that this is, yeah. You know, well, let me read verse fourteen and fifteen. He said, "Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church, the living God of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth." So he describes what he said. He said, I want people to know how they're supposed to conduct themselves in the church, which is God's household. You understand? That, you know, let's let's dissect these a little bit. You understand what it what, when Paul says the church is the household of God. You know, every one of us in here represents some kind of a household. All right? It may not be as like it was before. It may be different. Maybe there's little kids running around now, but you have, you know, the powers have a household. Okay? It's the power clan, right? It's a clan. Got a whole bunch of little little powers running around, little whatevers running around, and and you know, and we got, but it's that, but it's not my household. I have a different household. You have your own household. The church is God's house. It's where God. It's not a building, guys. Understand that. It's not. A, it's not about. This is just brick and mortar. It's the the church is about people. It's the temple of God, which is the people. The Spirit and God comes to live in. When we're converted, when we're baptized to Christ, the Spirit comes and lives with us and makes His dwelling with us, and we are the temple of the whole of, of God Himself. It's a it's a, a marked uh, symbolic of what the church was. You know, the church, the the temple and the tabernacle is symbolizes what we become through the washing of the blood. We become the tabernacle. We become the, the, the temple of God, okay? And he says it's the household of God. Tell you that, how, to understand when you finally wrap your mind around that God has added me to his family. You'll hear me pray a lot that we have connection to each other because of Christ, only because of Christ. We have connection with each other. We are, we are bound. You know, the relationships we have are eternal. You understand that? It's eternal. They're not, they're not superficial based on uh, chrono, chronological things, but times, not, not based on that. It is eternal. We get to be a part of the greatest institution that's ever been established on the earth, the kingdom of God. That, that pillar, that foundation, that, that church is eternal. It will not only live here, but it will survive after. The Roman Empire, the Empire of the United States of America, the Russian Empire, they will all go at some point. They will cease to exist at some point and something will take their place. The church will not. And I get to be a part of that. You get to be a part of that. 
And if you're not a part of that this morning, you know, pay attention to what he's saying here, that the church is the household of God. The only, and when we get, when we study in, in Galatians in, on Wednesday night, we're in chapter 3 in Galatians, and it talks about that, that we are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. And chapter 4 talks about us being adopted, that God adopts us. So, you know, that is, you know, I've, I wasn't adopted. I wasn't adopted in real life. So I don't know what that feels like. I have no idea. I was adopted in this spiritual life, and I know how that feels. For God to say, I care about you enough to make you mine. I want you for my, for me. And this is what needs to happen for you to get there. This is what, what the requirements are for you to do that. So when he calls us the foundation, and he says we're the, the church, the household, we understand that, okay? We understand what that means. What do you think it means when he said, he said, look at the next part. He said, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. What is that? What do you think that means? What do you think that means? That the, the, the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. You understand what a foundation is? Any of you guys, you know, I know you do. You know, I know Ann does. You know, that's what she did before she moved here. She had a, her, 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 her first husband had a concrete business and they poured concrete slabs. They know, he, she knows what foundation is. You know what it is. You know, I know what what is, you know, what it, what it means to be a foundation. What does it mean to you to be a foundation? What does it mean that the church is the foundation of the truth? What does that mean? It's taken upon us to make sure that others know the truth. Okay. We're not okay. continue to move okay. forward. So that we all have to lay that down on others and get okay. the followers to come along with us. God has made it a plan. The plan was that the church, his family, his bride, the bride of Christ, is going to be the foundation. It's going to be the it's going to be the bedrock of the truth. And ask yourself, okay? <laughs> ask yourself. This means that the church must uphold the truth of God's word. Would you say that's true? We have the responsibility to hold up the truth of God's word. How? How you do that? How do we uphold the truth of God's word? If we're going to be the foundation of the truth, how are we going to do that? Proclaim, how do we do that? Huh? Proclaiming only the gospel. Proclaiming. What did you say, Steve? Right here, by the Bible. By the Bible. Proclaiming the gospel. What, what else? Come on. Make make it more personal. Come on. I have to walk out of this building, guys. Okay? And I can't walk into my car and go down to a restaurant or go home or go to work and act like some knucklehead. Uh-oh. You told me you were coming. <laughs> well, I told them they can't go. Huh? I told them they can't go. They can't go? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. If you guys want to go, if you got little kids and you want to go and y'all want to be a part of that, he's coming to get you now. See, they like me better than you anyway. That's right. If you have kids or grandkids, if we're doing Easter egg hunt, you want to come take pictures, you want to be a part of that, that's fine. I will not hold it against you, I promise. You want really if you want to go with your kids, go ahead. Go. You can always get this. Guys, y'all can get this and watch it online. Okay? You can't. Look at this. He's gonna spin out my class. <laughs> no. I knew he was gonna do that. That's awesome. Y'all can always get I know Mac watches this thing all the time anyway, so he can watch he can watch it online. So and you're gonna and guys, y'all are not gonna get out of this because you're gonna hear some of this. At my communion thought this morning. So you'll hear some of it anyway. So anyway, so how do we become, if we're the church, if we are the church of God, the church of the living God, how do we become the foundation of the truth? How do we do that? Not necessarily at this place, but as an individual, how do I become, make sure that I am the foundation? Because I wrote a, I wrote a note down here. Misconduct and disorder in the church will weaken the support of God's truth in the world every time. You understand what I said? Misconduct and disorder in the church. And we have seen it. Okay? We've seen this. Mis, mis, you know, disorder, misconduct, people doing what they should not do. People going from here and singing, oh, I love Jesus, and going out there and acting like a complete fool. That's not going to strengthen at all the foundation of the truth. It can't. So how are we going to make sure that that's what happens, that we that we, that we we create that foundation and we become that foundation of the truth? How are we going to do that? Huh? Let people see it in you. Let people see it in you. It's be Christ-like. Be Christ-like. 
How, how many of you are completely comfortable with the way you pulled that off in the last in the last six months? Like that. Wow. Nobody? <laughs> nobody? Guys, y'all can't see it, but nobody raised their hand. You know what? I am. I'm not where I want to be, but I strive with everything I have to live up to the truth. I don't always get it right. Don't always. But I'm moving in this direction, not that way. So now how many of you would say, I've done okay for the last six months? See? I, are you moving forward? Are you trying to get better? Absolutely, we are. Absolutely. You're not going to be in six months. Hopefully, you won't be in six months where you are now. You'll be better in six months. But are we standing for truth now? So when I go into the, you know, I may make a mistake. I may go into Walmart. Somebody does something and I say something and, it, you know, I go, man, what? you're a knucklehead. Why'd you do that? And then try to fix it. You know, I I went into Walmart the other day, and I don't know what it was. I had I had something in the basket, and when I got out of the car, I was in a hurry, and it was laying in the basket. And and so I went in the next day, and I bought the same item, and I made that lady charge me twice. I said, charge me twice for this. She said, what for? I didn't know if she saw it or not. It was the same lady. I didn't know if she saw it or not. I wasn't going to take that chance. You know, I, I wanted to make sure that, and it was a great teaching opportunity. I want, And I wasn't trying to up myself. I just wanted to say, hey, I got one yesterday. I saw I didn't pay for it. I'm going to pay for two of them today. So charge me for two of them. I think that's a way we, we can, because they don't see that often. They don't see that kind of stuff in the world. They see people, you know, I, I, found, some, I, you, I found some stuff in a basket at Sam's the other day. And it was a big package of lunch meat. I mean, this thing was probably $15 worth of lunch meat. I pulled myself in a car, grabbed it, went back inside, and gave it to the girl and said, I found this in the basket. Man, you know, what would most people do? Take it home. Take it home. Hey, I'm not, you know, I feel like that, that if we're going to stand for truth and stand for truth. Okay? Stand for truth. I think that's how we do that. I think, and, and I know some of you have done that same kind of thing. You're not in a position I'm in where I can tell you about it. I'm not trying to toot my horn. I'm just telling you, this is, I think, what it looks like. <laughs> what it looks like to say, I'm going to stand for truth. What is truth? But you know, honestly, mm -hmm. that speaks sermons in itself. And those people where you might never be able to talk about it for them, that spoke. Yeah. That's right. and, and I, and like, guys, I didn't bring attention to myself. I didn't say, oh, man, and then I'm so good. Look at this. I'm good. Man, I just, I just walked in. I said, here, somebody left in the basket, and I turned around and walked out. I didn't want to make a, a scene about it. I, I didn't. I don't know. Man, if it had been my lunch meat, I would have been really hacked off when I got home. <laughs> you know, wouldn't you have? Yes. I would have been really mad. You know, I don't know if I would have went back to Sam's for 15 bucks, but, but somebody, maybe they needed that money. And maybe they could go there and say, oh, yeah, some guy brought it back in. Here it is. Yeah. How would they feel then? They won't know who it is, and I don't care about that. But I think God always watches us. He always sees us, and he always knows what's going on. And I think he's the one I'm trying to impress. He's the one that I want to glorify, right? I'm not trying to glorify you. I'm trying to glorify myself. I'm trying to glorify him. So I think we have to be aware all the time of what we're doing. So if I'm going to be the pillar, the, the thing that holds it, I remember when, when Katrina uh, came through here. Was it Katrina? No, it wasn't Katrina. It was what? What was the uh, Harvey. Harvey? When Harvey came through, there was a bunch of us here at this building. Okay, have any of y'all ever been in the in the junior high room? Any of y'all ever been in there? Y'all remember what's in there? There's big round poles about that big around that hold that part of the building up. They're they're spaced in there, and that was part of the old building. That was the side part of the old building. Big big round. Kevin was in there with the kid, and and I slept through it. He said. He said, that pole was moving. He said, I don't know how, how, how high the winds got, but the pole was, this thing, this thing, I don't know, how, how big, Jimmy, think that pole is around? That's so, uh, like that. Those columns? Yeah. Those columns. He said it was moving. He said he could feel it moving. You know, I mean, somebody built this thing to withstand that, where that column didn't fall, didn't collapse, didn't crumble. And that's what this is talking about. You're going to be the foundation, the pillar of the church is. We have to make sure that that's what it's like here. Okay? It has to be that here. If we're going to, if we're going to pull off what he's called us to do, then we have got to be what this says for us to be. Now, how are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? How, should, how do you think we ought, to, we ought to do that? Not as individuals, but as a church. Now, 
as, as, as a body. How do you think we ought to do that? What do you think we ought to do? Stick to the truth. Stick to the truth. Okay. Steadfast. Steadfast. Try to always be kind. Okay. All right. <laughs> you want to hear? Yeah. You're doing that because you're teaching. Okay. That we have to stick. To. If we don't hear that repeatedly, okay. it's real easy to drift off. So okay. You're doing that. All right. All right. Anybody else? What do you think? What do you be, think? What should we do? Huh? Be welcoming. Be welcoming. You be welcoming. That's what I said. Well, if you see somebody you don't recognize, walk up and talk and say, hey, my name's Larry. How are you doing, man? It may be somebody who's been here a while, but you know what? I do that all the time. <laughs> so, hey, you'll get used to it after a while, and they'll start to laugh about it. They, well, I, you know, I, I went up and shook Sean, and I, 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 I could, and it dawned on me who he was. I'd seen him before, you know? but I couldn't. I didn't, man, I'm, you have to understand, I'm 71 years old. I'm getting old. It just, you know, that kind of stuff comes and goes. So, you know, I use that as an excuse all day. Somebody else had their hand up. Uh, yeah. I mean, with, like Timmy, he's always inviting people in and out cars. And stuff, yeah. Trying to get people to go. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Yeah. And to do that, to be that kind of individual where you're always welcoming people, always always going, you have to make sure that you keep yourself in a in a right place. Because if you don't, they're looking for it. They're look, you know, Cole was right when he said this morning. If you think it's not getting to that place where you're gonna have to make a decision about what you believe, at some point it's gonna reach up and bite you. You know, you hear the story the other day where, where a guy was bragging about ripping off the cartel, and they came into, into Laredo across the border and grabbed him, beat him up, and drug him back into Mexico. You know, you know, there, there, is a, there was a preachers in Canada being arrested for teaching the truth. Lady in, in UK got arrested for praying in her head. She wasn't praying out loud. She bowed her head and she prayed, and they arrested her. You think that's not going to happen here at some point? I'm telling you. So the only thing that's going to sustain us, the only thing that's going to sustain the, the world and this and the church is for us to stand for truth no matter what. You look at the, look at danger in the face and say, I don't care what you're going to do to me. I'm going to tell you what I believe. This is what I believe. Now, that's not easy to do. But, you know, when I ask you, how do we stand for truth? You know, yeah, guys like me, I mean, this it's easy. I've got an easy platform. But how do you how do we do that? As a church, Vic, I think, said, per we have to be welcoming. Let people know who we are. Let people know that we're glad you're here so that the guys that do different stuff can do that different stuff with them. Yep. You may be the first line that gets to them, you know, and, and you know, it may be, it may be Ann doing it when she's here on Tuesday putting songs together. She may be the first line of getting someone here and may never even know it. But we have to be about doing the same thing. Always. Now, I want to look at this next verse. Okay. Got it now? You understand what the what the church is and what the responsibility. I think we have a tremendous responsibility in a really corrupt, evil world. Because if, if you you do understand how corrupt and evil this world is. Amen. And how ungodly it is. It is an ungodly place. Get get on some, some websites and just watch what what they find acceptable to do, and you will cringe at what people are doing and what they're doing to your children. I'm telling you, okay? So, you know, and then he, then Paul is right. Remember, he's writing to Timothy, and listen to what he says. Verse 16, beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He's talking about Jesus. He said the mystery of the mystery from which true godliness springs True godliness can't spring from anywhere else. You can't do enough. You can't do what's necessary to be godly, to be a godly individual. You can't. You're never going to be good enough, ever. You can't. You're going to constantly fall short. The only one that can make you this way is Jesus. The only one. He is the only answer. You can't do it any possible way by yourself. You can't. It's never been about you and me. It's always been about him. You got that? He said, he, and Paul said, he said, man, he said, beyond all question, the mystery from which true God in the springs is great. And then what he does, he quotes probably a Christian hymn that somebody wrote in the first century. We're not sure. It's not, it's not somewhere in the text. Or maybe it's a, you know, maybe not a, a, a hymn, but maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a song, like a song that someone wrote, like a poem that someone wrote, Okay. We know that he's quoted it. Where he got it from, we don't know. And I looked at numerous commentaries. They didn't. They all said the same thing. 
we don't know exactly where this came from. They all agreed that it was probably some kind of a Christian hymn that maybe the church in the first century sang in their worship services. All right, and listen to what he says. Now I'm going to read the first part again. Beyond all questions, the mystery from which true God in the springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up to glory. I'm going to read it again. He appeared in the flesh. The whole gospel, everything about the gospel, is contained in those verses right there. In just those lines. Everything. He said, he appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. I want us to look at this, you know, from a... Uh, yeah. When you look at the idea of the mystery of true godliness, there is so much misinformation out there that says it's acceptable. This is what God requires. And I could list them all day long about what different people out there say God requires this, God requires that, God requires this, God, you know, and 99% of them would be wrong. Okay, 99% of them would be wrong. 99% of them, or many of them, they put a spin on Christ. They kind of spin it. They don't necessarily say he's the answer. They kind of say he's the answer, but they don't necessarily say he's the answer. It's really, I'm going to, you know, it, it's up to me to be the, the, the person I need to be. You know, it's up to me to, 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 to be the, 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 the maker of godliness in my life. Garbage. That's garbage. If you could do that, then what, did he, what are we celebrating Easter for? What do you go to the cross for if you could do that on your own? I want to know. If you could make yourself godly, then why in the world did he go to the cross and come out of the tomb on the third day? Why did he do that? If you could do that, then he didn't need to. The mystery is that you couldn't do it, and the only way you could get what you have, the only way you could get where you're at, is you have to have him to do that. Now, you know, when, when it says, it says he, would, he appeared in the flesh, we understand. John chapter 1 says, in, the, in verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. doesn't tell you in that verse who it is. You ask people, well, what is that? Who, who, who is that? Well, they say, oh, that's Jesus. Well, that doesn't say that. That verse doesn't say that. You have to go all the way to verse 14. And then in verse 14, and he said, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now you know who it was. You know it was Jesus. He became flesh. Philippians chapter 2 says he left his home. He left heaven and humbled himself, became a man, and, and humbled himself to, to the point of death on the cross. What for? To make this mystery a reality. To make godliness happen, able to happen in your life and my life. Because you couldn't do it. Somebody had to do it. God's plan from the very beginning was to do it. God's plan before he created the heavens and the earth, he, he was going to do it. People say, well, why do you do it? Ask him when you get there. Ask him, I don't know. He's God. He do what he wants. How many times have your kids asked you, why do you do that? You know, you know you can't tell them because they're not going to understand anyone. I, so you didn't say, because I said so. <laughs> you ever, you ever, because I said so. I used to hate that. <laughs> I used to hate, you know. I loved it when I could do it to my kids. I, I loved it. They probably hated it too. I can't stand when he does that. Probably Rob was stomping off in the room and, you know, stuck in the park and popping. You know, I'm sure that's what they did. You know, I caught him a couple of times. But you know, the, the point is, is, is God's going to do what God does. I don't, I can't give you answers for all of this stuff. What I can tell you is that God's plan, because of what it says in the book, the plan was to was to bring salvation to a lost and dying world. Well, it says he doesn't want any to perish. There you go. He, he Second Peter chapter 3 says that. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. Somebody asked me the other day, I was in a, uh, I was in AutoZone, and a guy, I know him, and we talk religion sometimes when, we, when he has time. And he said, he said, man, he said, it's the weekend. I said, yep, it is going to be coming up on the weekend. And he said, yep, it's the weekend. He said, he said, this is, this is the, this is a celebration of, of him coming out of the tomb. I said, yep. He said, I think he's coming back this weekend. 
And I said, you think? He said, what do you think? I said, no, I don't think so. No, I'm sorry, I don't think so. I didn't have time because he got had a customer and I had to go. What I would have wanted to tell him was, you know, that very verse. God didn't want anyone to perish. And as long as people are coming to him, Jesus ain't coming back. I'm, I'm telling you, he, as long as that's happening, I don't believe he's coming back. And what did Jesus say? He didn't even know the day and the hour. Nobody. You think, you know, he said, he said that it's going to happen like a thief in the night. You ever been, you ever been robbed? You ever been somebody, somebody stole something from you? You ever had that happen to you? I have. I had a shop broke into. You know what they didn't do? Wait you Call me two days ahead and say, hey, guy, we're coming over tomorrow. <laughs> they didn't tell me that. If they would have, what I'd done, I'd have been there with a gun. Said, no, you're not. I got there and it had already been done. I talked to a guy in the jail and I said, I'm going to get a dog. He said, get your dog. He said, I'll kill the dog. <laughs> he said, if I want your stuff, I'm going to take your stuff. Nothing you can do about it. I said, you know, well, yeah, and, I'm, and I'm going, yeah, okay. So, you know, I mean, I, it, it's a, Jesus is here and he's going to come back when you don't expect him to come. Because if he's coming like a thief, you're not going to know when it is. You're not going to be able to guess it, it in existence. So I wanted to tell him, and I will tell him at some point. I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to tell him at some point, because I'm going to remind him what he asked me. And But, you know, when you look at this and say, I know Jesus came in bodily form, and I know why. He came so you and you and you can have life. Because without it, you can't. And then he says, look at what he said, and vindicated by the Spirit. That your, some of your families may have justified by the Spirit. The word in, means, it, 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 really, it really means to, uh, uh, to, what do you think vindicated means? What do you, what do you think that means? Clear. Huh? Clear. Cleared? Received. To make it true. To, to, make, to make it true. To verify. To vindicate. So there, I guess they're done. <laughs> Mine said it. Mine said in the, in the notes that I guess so. the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead and thereby vindicated him, showing that he was indeed the Son of God. Yes, yes. You know, I, I, wrote, a, I wrote a couple of uh, uh, a couple of notes down here, and, and I'm just going to tell you what they are. Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus comes to John, if you look at the, at the context in John, G, John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Remember that text? Well, in Matthew chapter 3, he comes to John again and he comes to be baptized and john says man no 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 you don't understand i you you should be baptizing me not this and jesus says let this be so to fulfill all righteousness okay? and it says after he's baptized it says that the spirit descended on him like as a dove i remember i don't know if you were in that study at that time me and rocky were in it, and i asked wayne wheeler i said because i'm i'm in quiz i want to know and i said Tell me something. Does the Holy Spirit look like a dove? Because I didn't understand. And Dwayne went to the, the very, very kindly telling me what it meant that the Holy Spirit descended in a, in a thing where they would understand. And what happens from heaven? What happens? The Holy Spirit is there, going to come on him. And he comes on him in that shape. And he said, and the, said, this is my son whom I love. Right? And the Spirit... The Spirit verifies who he is in front of all those people, and still, what does John do when he's in prison? What does he do? Calls for somebody and says, are you really the one we've been waiting for? He heard God talk from heaven, and it's still. So don't be, don't, don't be uh, impatient with people when you deal with them, because sometimes they just don't get it right away. Sometimes it's difficult to get it. Sometimes it's hard, okay? But we have to remember that the Holy Spirit is here as a help. He's a here to verify, and he's, and he's living in us to do the same thing. When we were baptized into Christ, what did he say? What did Peter tell them? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, I think 2 Corinthians chapter 1 or 2 says, says that he was the gift. The Holy Spirit was the gift to indwell us. To do what? To verify Jesus through us. 
I get to, I can go back to AutoZone sometime, and I'm going to go up to that guy. I know what kind of car he drives. I know what he's going to be there. And if I don't have nothing, I'm going, I'm going to pull in there. Because I know he's a great shirt. You don't know what that means. That means he's one of the, he's one of the guys that he kind of, he's like an in charge guy. So I know he'll be on the floor, and I'll be able to find him. <laughs> I'm going in after him. And I want to let him know why I believe what why I believe what I said, and I, and that's because I believe the Holy Spirit. You know, as soon as I drove off, I knew exactly what I would said to him. And and I believe that didn't come from me. That came from that Spirit that's motivating me and moving me and helping me helping me to be part of that found that little piece of that foundation of the truth and a pillar of the of the church. So you know, and, but that that Holy Spirit vindicated. Now look at we need to move on. Look at what he what he said. He said he was seen by angels. Seen by angels. You remember when he comes out of the tomb? It's perfect for this for today. You remember what they what the angels say? He ain't for, what are you looking for? He ain't here. He gone. He gone. That was an angel who said that. Did the, you think the angel saw him? Sure. Absolutely. You think the angels it says when he was in the garden and he was and he was begging for his life. He's sweating as if sweating blood. He's begging for his life. What did it say that God did? He, and he tells he tells Peter, don't you know I could call 12 legions of angels? That's 72,000 angels. You don't know how many that is. 72,000. I don't know if it'd take all that many, but, you know, to get him off the cross. It didn't take but one in Hezekiah's day, so I don't think it would take him that many. But the point is, is angels were there minister. It says that angels came and ministered to him, okay? Didn't give him what he wanted, but ministered to him while he was grieving and agonizing in the garden because he was going to do what you needed him to do. He didn't need to do it for himself. He needed you. You needed him to do it. That's why we take, and well, I'm not going to get there. You know, we'll, you'll, you'll listen to some of that in a bit. All right. He said, and it was preached among the nations. What was the promise to Abraham, guys? What was the promise? You remember what the promise was? Through your seed, all nations are going to be blessed. So when, when it says he preached to all nations, only Jesus made that possible. When Peter goes to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, and Cornelius is a Roman soldier, he's a Gentile, he's a godless individual according to Peter and the Jews. And what does Peter say? I ain't going over there. Remember that? He said, I ain't going over there. I'm not going over there. That guy's, no, nah, I'm, nah, I'm not going over there. And, and God says, oh, yes, you are. Yeah, you're going. And when Paul is called, and Paul is a scoundrel, he's a, he's a murdering skunk. As Saul, I'm just, I'm just telling you, you know, he's there holding the coats when Stephen is stoned to death. That must have been gruesome to watch. And when he's called, and Ananias tells him, God's got a plan for you, and you're going to be a herald, a herald to the Gentile world. So when he says here, he says, and this mystery was preached to the nations. That's us, guys. It was preached to us. Whoever preached to you, whenever he preached it to you, was because of Jesus going to the cross and fulfilling the mystery. And then he said, was believed on in the world? People believe. You know, 10 days after he ascends into heaven, 10 days, 10, 10 days. He leaves 40 days after he comes out of the tomb, and on the 50th day, Peter gets up and preaches, and 3,000 people believe in him and are baptized to Christ and are added to the church. 3,000. That's what he's talking about. And they believed. And there was only 120 of them left that were still faithful and still and still in the upper room hiding and fearing for their life. And then he says, was believed on in the world and was taken up in glory. When Jesus leaves in Acts chapter 1, and they're all standing looking at him, an angel comes and says, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? He said, don't you know he's going to come back the same way he left? He's gone. Took him up into glory. And I've got text here, but we don't have time to read them. Uh, you know, I mean, there's there's Acts chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1. In fact, yeah, I want, to, I want to read the one in Hebrews. I think it's important. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, and then I'll be done. And we're going to start chapter 4 next week. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And if you want to hear the study on this book, we're going to start it on Wednesday night at some point, whenever we get through Galatians. Chapter 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by, the, by his powerful word. After he provided purification for sins, 
He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. What did it say in this in this last part? And he said, and he was taken up into glory. Where is he? Seated at the right hand of the Father. In glory, waiting for you to come home. I can't wait to see him and tell him thank you. And while we're here, you know what we're going to do? We're going to thank him every single day. We're going to get a chance to go do that in just a minute. To thank him publicly. Some of you will sit in the middle and you'll be on camera. I know you have you won't sit over in camera here, but you'll be able to sit in camera over there, and they're gonna, people are gonna watch you all over the world. They're gonna watch, they're gonna see the back of your head, but they're gonna watch you. Not Bring honor to God because of what he's done and where he's at now. He's waiting for you to come home. That's where that's where we talked to Sid when we talked to him, and Sid was ready to go home because he knew what was waiting for him. And I and I envy him. I envy him because his is over and ours is still going on. Thank you guys. We'll start chapter four next week. Thank you guys for watching, watching man. Uh, like I said, you want to get your dish? Come and get it. Take it to the car, or you can come out to the service.